I serve on. Good morning. My name is Karen Sanders, and I am an RN patient advocate serving on the Health Education Series Committee, Planning Committee, and it is my great delight to welcome you to our virtual Fab Friday here at Ollie at UNCA Asheville, North Carolina. Thank you for all of you, all of you joining us this morning. I want to just say um, we've had a little bit of an error on the Asheville Today uh, notification that it, it, it uh, was a mistake, that it, it indicated this morning that it was Dr. Large who was presenting this presentation today. And it is, that was incorrect. It's actually Dr. Adam Kaufman who's gonna be presenting his talk on avoiding hip fractures. I will be introducing him shortly, but I'd like to turn um, this webinar over to Jenny Felice, who is the chairperson of our Health Education Series Planning Committee at OLLI. Hi, hi, Jenny. Hi, how you doing? Listen, folks, we are so thrilled to have you back. We miss you so much. And um, we understand there were about 148 people signed up for this, which is one of our largest, would have been one of our largest crowds if everybody does show. I'm the chair of the committee, the other people on the committee, I want you to think about, um, we're gonna be asking you for your ideas about um, what you'd like to see on Fab Fridays going forward. We miss having your evaluations and your suggestions. So if you have ideas about what you'd like to be uh, see, we have four sessions in the spring semester and we are happy to um, address what you're interested in. Um, so, or you can speak to any one of the committee members and they include David Mao, Bill O'Connell, Karen and I, Phil Lenowitz, Wooly Wisham, Hope Warshaw, and Barbara Heller. Um, so um, at the beginning of this talk and then at the end, there'll be an opportunity for you to be able to write questions and answers. In the middle of the talk, we'd like you to hold questions and answers that section for questions to for Dr. Kaufman. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this back to Karen and we'll get started. So good morning again. I just want to say that um, we are going to, because we're in the webinar format, we want you to add your questions to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen for Zoom. And um, as Jenny indicated, I will be uh, taking your questions in groupings uh, when Dr. Kaufman um, pauses during the present his presentation. So just want to say that to you. So for this minute, I'm going to show you a PowerPoint about Dr. Kaufman and his wonderful experience. So this is Dr. Adam Kaufman. And um, he is, and he, we are so delighted to have him be with us today. He is the, an orthopedic trauma surgeon and he oversees HCA Missions Fracture Prevention and Bone Health Clinic here in Asheville, North Carolina. He graduated with honors summa cum laude from Bucknell University and he was named the most outstanding student, twice named student athlete of the year. He graduated from Harvard University Medical School he completed his internship and residency in orthopedic surgery from Duke University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. His subspecialty fellowship training was um, orthopedic and orthopedic trauma surgery at the University of Maryland's Shock Trauma Hospital. His clinical interests include total hip replacement surgery of pelvis and acetabulum, elderly and pediatric fracture care, periarticular, and that would be around the joint, fracture care, non-union and malunion correction, post-traumatic reconstruction, and treatment of musculoskeletal infections. He is a surgeon ambassador of the National Osteoporosis Foundation. He teaches national courses to other surgeons on fracture care. He is an active researcher. He's presented lectures and published numerous articles on fracture surgery, post-traumatic total joint replacement, and soft tissue reconstruction. He moved to Asheville with his family, volunteers regularly at the Western North Carolina Rescues Missions Ministries, 
He's a Cub Scout leader. He received HCA's first annual first humanitarian award for community service. And in addition to all that, he is an outdoorsman, running, fishing, rock hounding. And then one of my favorite factoids about Dr. Kaufman is that he believes strongly in patient follow-up and care. And he learned about the importance of this issue from his father, who was a family care physician. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to say, welcome Dr. Kaufman. It is our great pleasure to have you with us this morning. Well, thank you so much for having me, uh, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much, Ali members, for um, paying attention to bone health and fracture prevention uh, care. Hopefully my uh, split screen is sharing with the audience and we can go ahead. I'm so sorry in advance that we're not seeing each other face to face, but um, such are the times we live in. <laughs> Thank you uh, again, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. I'm here to speak with you about uh, bone health and fracture prevention care. Again, I'm one of the mission orthopedic surgeons. My specialty training is in fracture care and total hip replacement. And I also run our fracture prevention and bone health clinic, which we'll be hearing about uh, shortly. My first disclosure is that I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And those of you who may or may not have been around the medical field probably know that orthopedic surgeons are not known as the most uh, cerebral people in the world. Uh, but I'll still try to do my best uh, talking to you about this very complex topic of fall prevention and osteoporosis uh, management. I do hope you leave this webinar with a few things in mind. I hope to have introduced you to the problem of falls and fragility fractures, both here in Western North Carolina and uh, nation and worldwide. I hope to review some of the trends on fall screening and fall prediction. I hope to outline my personal approach and our approach to fracture prevention care and the referrals that we may get uh, from the community. And of course, learn from you and answer your questions what I need to do better for our patients what challenges that you have uh, in your own lives and, and what we need to do better as a medical community for you. And of course, uh, I want you not to have any falls anymore. Uh, and I don't wanna see you in our clinic and our emergency room, uh, no offense. So we'll start with an 85 year old patient. This is a real patient. This is kind of a case that is not uncommon here at Mission. Uh, if you look at the x-ray on the right side, you see the patient's already had a fall and already had a fracture. If you look on the left side of that image, you may be able to see uh, in this area here, there's another fracture. So this is the patient's second hip fracture. And in discussing this patient, I'd like to talk to you about how this could have happened, recurrent falls in, in the elderly population, how this could have been prevented, potential treatment options for this patient, and special programs available uh, here in Western North Carolina to kind of prevent these things from happening uh, in the future. But before we delve into those topics, it's often helpful to change people's perception about bone, about the skeleton. This is kind of my life's work and I, I, I spent a vast majority of my time in the hospital working on the skeleton. And most people think of broken bones like this, uh, this hip fracture here, the bone is soft, uh, the patient took a fall and has a trauma and, and we have a fracture. And really when we're talking about bone health and fracture prevention, we have to reorient ourselves so that we're thinking not of, of bone, but of the kind of microscopic view of what that bone looks like if we were to put it uh, again under 100X magnification or something like that. So the bone on the left is good, healthy, strong, young person bone. You can see that honeycomb has thick white bony trabeculi and the bone on the right would be osteoporotic bone. So bone that's been kind of worn down over time. The body has chosen to resorb bone as it naturally does over the course of decades. And what we're left with is a very spongy soft bone that does not um, accommodate force as well as the bone on the left and leaves it very susceptible to fracture. So when we talk about bone health and fracture prevention, fall prevention, in some respects, we're talking about the microscopic uh, life of a bone. So now that we have that in mind, let's introduce the problem. Uh, and it's a huge one if you look at things from the scale of Western North Carolina. 
uh, and the scale of our country. So we know that the 65 and older age group is the fastest growing segment of the United States population, up to 9 million in the next few years. And we know that this is a huge uh, subset of our population here in Western North Carolina, of my patient population. About one fourth of our friends and neighbors in Western North Carolina are over the age of 65. We also know that falls are the leading cause of injury-related morbidity and mortality among the elderly. What does that mean? It means that young people are more susceptible to violent injuries uh, or traumas like accidents. This changes when we deal with the elderly. With patients over the age of 65, the vast majority of fractures we see are from falls. We know that up to 30% of elderly folks who live in the community, not just skilled nursing facility folks or independent living folks, these are people who have their own houses, will fall. And that rate increases with age, such that patients over the age of 85, the majority of patients will sustain a fall in the next year. And this equates to almost 30 million falls per year and 2.8 million emergency room visits uh, from elderly patients here in the United States. So these are, I'm just gonna run through some more statistics again, just to underline the problem that faces us. We know that 20 to 30% of elderly falls result in severe injury, whether that be fracture, laceration, uh, whether it be head injury, and this equates to 33,000 deaths per year. I'll say that again, falls account for 33,000 deaths per year. 100 people die every day in the United States because of falls. For me, that's, that's way too many. We know that this also means a lot of emergency room visits. We know that fall patients have a high mortality at one year. And as taxpayers, we know that up to $32 billion of our money goes to treat fall-related injuries, which is up to 6% of all expenditures in our elderly population. Despite the commonality and the severe consequences of these falls, fewer than 50% of patients ever discuss fall prevention with their primary care doctor. I'll say that again. Falls are the main cause of injury in the elderly population. We know that Millions of falls happen every year and fewer than 50% of patients ever discuss with the primary care provider fall prevention. And I bet if I were to take a show of hands, if we were in person, I would bet the minority of you had ever discussed this with your primary care doctor, although the majority of you probably have had a fall over the past year or two. Now, this becomes even more crucial when we talk about patients who are in long-term care facilities, patients who uh, don't live independently. We know that for every patient uh, in these uh, care facilities, uh, there's 1.7 uh, falls per year. We know that patients who do fall in facilities have a typically a more significant outcome or injury uh, based on that. And the severity is uh, five times more common or more severe than the community ambulatory geriatric patient. So why am I here? Why did you ask me to come and talk to you? The answer is because falls and osteoporosis result in fragility fractures. Again, not to bore you with statistics, but once every six seconds, so by the time I'm done this sentence, someone will have sustained a fragility fracture in the world. There are 9 million of them per year, equating to 2.1 million fragility fractures in the United States annually, which is more than the incidence of stroke, heart attack, and breast cancer combined. So while there are a lot of ribbons and walks for these things, and there's a lot of publicity for things like stroke and heart attack and breast cancer, and rightfully so, fall prevention takes a back seat, although it's much more common than these, than these issues. We know that the most common mechanism of fragility fractures is falls. So despite the severity and despite the commonality of these fragility fractures and falls, we as orthopedic surgeons do a horrendous job of fall prevention and osteoporosis care. So as a couple of comparators, I'll ask you to think about, estimate if you're uh, the, the rate of colon cancer screening in the United States among primary care providers. How, what percentage of patients going into their primary care doctor are appropriately screened for colon cancer? And the answer is about 75%. I'll ask you another question. In the, in the acute management of heart attack patients, what percentage of heart attack patients 
leave the hospital on appropriate medications. Leave the hospital on appropriate medications. That answer is about 90%. And I'll ask you what percentage of hip fracture patients, patients who have had a life altering injury, what percentage of those patients ever get on appropriate osteoporosis management? So we have numbers like 75, we have numbers like 90, and it turns out that the number of patients who get on osteoporosis management after a life-altering hip fracture is about 18%. So we as orthopedic surgeons do a horrendous job of osteoporosis management, and it's no wonder. Unlike other issues, it's a natural part of aging. The postmenopausal female, unfortunately, is programmed to lose 1% to 3% of bone mineral density every year. That's what your body is programmed to do. So in some respects, we're fighting upstream, swimming upstream when it comes to uh, kind of reversing the natural portions of aging. Number two, it is a silent disease, osteoporosis. No one ever clutches their chest and says, I'm having an osteoporosis attack, call a doctor right? You don't know that you have this disease until you have a fracture or until you have a DEXA scan. And even then, up to two-thirds of very common fractures like spine fractures are asymptomatic, meaning they don't, they don't, they're not associated with pain. In addition, osteoporosis, as we'll learn, is an extremely difficult uh, clinical entity, unlike something like diabetes, which may be easy to control and diagnose and figure out sometimes. Uh, osteoporosis is multifactorial. There are many things that contribute to it. And the treatment as such is multimodal. There are many things that you need to do to make sure that patients don't have falls and don't have fractures. And number four is primary care is very hard. So Karen mentioned my dad's a primary care doctor. And when I start talking to him about osteoporosis, he just, he glazes over and he says, Adam, you know, I love you like a son. And I say, I am your son. But he says, I love you like a son, uh, but I just don't have time for osteoporosis care. I have patients who have heart disease and lung disease and kidney disease. And I just, I don't, I can't fit it into, in, into my uh, clinic appointment. And that is the unfortunate reality of our medical system. So hopefully the, this segment of our talk has introduced the issue of falls the issue of osteoporosis and some of our difficulties in managing and preventing those those clinical entities. Karen, are there any uh, relevant questions that I can answer now? I think you're still muted, Karen. Thank you. Um, there are no questions. And just a reminder to participants, you can typing questions to the Q&A box to ask Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. Sure. Um, so let's get into the weeds a little bit. Uh, this slide is, uh, is, uh, is kind of a funny one. Um, it asks, why do these patients get injured? And these are kind of no brainers, right? The guy on the left is about to throw a bucket of water on an electrical fire. And the guys on the right are having a great time in their uh, jacuzzi powered by a boat motor. So you can, you can easily predict why those patients are gonna get injured. It's a little less obvious when we deal with falls. So this is a very busy slide and I apologize, but I've highlighted the important thing. This is a, from an, a review article that sought to determine why elderly folks fall. And the answer is for a number of different reasons, which are highlighted. So 31% of patients, for instance, at the top are from an accident or for an environmental or related cause. They slip on ice or a rug or something like that. 17% have gait disorders, 13% have dizziness, 9% have uh, weakness caused a drop attack. And you can see there are various, there are a number of different causes uh, that can result in, in falls. And we see that a little bit flushed out here. Uh, intrinsic factors, factors that are uh, individual to a patient, age, cognitive impairment like early dementia or Alzheimer's, sensory defects like change in sensation, change in gait, lower extremity weakness, behavioral problems, all these things can contribute to falls. Extrinsic factors like the environment or medications or shoe wear or equipment issues, home issues are also very relevant. And you can imagine, again, as we try to untie the knot here, as we try to diagnose why people are falling and prevent those things, it can be something as easy as their glasses aren't working or something as hard as they've been smoking since they were six and their bone mineral density is terrible. 
So it, it's, it's a really difficult thing from a diagnostic standpoint and from a treatment standpoint. And we'll get into the weeds of that a little bit. But first we have to identify kind of who is at the very highest risk, who in the audience should be the most worried. And again, this is a busy slide, I apologize, but it shows us from that same review article that patients with weakness, for instance, have up to five times the likelihood of falling as their neighbor who doesn't have weakness. Things like gait, gait changes, right? Trouble walking and trouble with balance and trouble with vision can impart up to a threefold increase in fall risk. So these are really our patients who are most at risk for falls and for whom uh, interventions directed at those risk factors may be the most successful. I'll pause again, Karen, any questions before we talk about how we actively treat patients? We don't have any questions yet, Adam. I think that usually means I'm either doing a very good job or a very bad job. <laughs> I hope it said I'm doing a very good job, um, but we will plow forward and stay on time. And again, if there are any, um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. I'd rather answer and have things clear uh, than delay the answer and uh, have folks scratching their heads for the rest of the talk. So that's great, Doc, fantastic introduction, very great slides, but what the heck do you actually do? So again, osteoporosis is hard. We have to fight aging. We have to fight a silent disease, which means a lot of what we do is awareness. And then we have to tackle some of these multifactorial problems in a multimodal treatment program. And this is my favorite depiction of what fracture prevention looks like. And there are four main pillars of our fracture prevention program here and elsewhere. Number one is fall prevention. Number two is lifestyle modification. Number three is supplementation, typically calcium and vitamin D. And number four is pharmacotherapy or medications. We will walk through these one at a time. But first we'll talk just a little bit about what happens, what our patient experience is like, or what you can expect when you walk into a fracture prevention provider. And the, the depiction on the left uh, upper side of the slide shows that it's really a team effort uh, where each one of us has our avenue of care and that all contributes uh, to the bone health of a patient. And below are some of the smiling faces here at Mission uh, who contribute to our team here. But just like other doctor's appointments, you'll be, uh, there'll be a history taking period. There'll be a time when we review other issues and medical history and social history. We'll make a diagnosis with radiology and lab work, and then we'll do a physical exam. So let's dive a little bit into what each one of those looks like. So we talk that patients fall and get injured for several reasons. We know why this patient is gonna fall and get injured. But the next patient who may be an elderly fracture patient, again, there are many different causes and we have to flush that out. You'll hear questions like, how did your injury happen? Tell me more about your fall. We are trying again to identify intrinsic factors, patient-specific factors that can contribute to falls and, and fragility fractures. We're also looking for extrinsic factors, something that may be as easy as removing throw rugs or putting lights in your hallway, uh, uh, changing the walker style that you use, right? Not, we know why these the patients who lived in this house got injured, but we have to figure out why the average fragility fracture patient got injured. That's a very different problem. And of course, do you fall often? Let's get a little bit more into the weeds with your fall history. We talked that several different medical issues can contribute to falls. And that's one of the big uh, uh, demands of our clinic is to sort out our patients having cognitive issues, neurologic issues like dementia, numbness, seizures. Uh, are, they are folks having problems with their vision or their balance or their hearing? Are they getting lightheaded because they have a rapid heart rate or because they're in heart failure? Do, are their bones weak because, uh, as number four suggests, uh, there's some problem with their GI tract? They're not absorbing calcium and vitamin D. Are folks falling because they're having a lot of urgency to go to the bathroom or they're getting up three times a night to urinate? Uh, you know, are they uh, falling because of an orthopedic issue, because of weakness or pain or guarding? 
Or, or is this a psychiatric issue, an issue wherein patients are on medications that are affecting their ability uh, uh, to, to mobilize safely? And dovetailing with the review of systems, also we'll be talking to you about past medical history, again, including cardiovascular issues, rheumatologic issues, orthopedic issues, neurologic issues. Uh, one of the big contributors, especially in the United States, is medications. There are several medications that can contribute to falls, and there are alternatives to some of these medications that would be, uh, I think, appropriate to talk to your primary care doctor about. Some of these medications include diuretics, which may lower your blood pressure or decrease your calcium levels. Narcotic pain medications uh, are poison for several different reasons, uh, not the least of which is they're incredibly addictive, but they also uh, can contribute to falls. Some of our more common heart medications like beta blockers can lower blood pressure and make people feel lightheaded. And psychotropic medications, antidepressives and antipsychotics are a huge issue uh, in our geriatric population. And one study went as far as to show a 66% reduction in falls just by manipulating some of those psychotropic medications. Again, this suggests that we can prevent up to two thirds of falls uh, in patients on these medications by just seeking out alternative uh, medications or therapies. Now, this is some of the easiest, when it comes to social history, what people do and how they behave, these are some of the easiest problems to identify, but as you can imagine, are some of the hardest problems to solve. So we'll learn that exercise and activity is exceedingly important, not only to uh, maintain muscle mass and bone mineral density, prevent falls, uh, but also keep patients safe. Uh, home safety is an issue, as we talked about. Recruiting family help for patients who need it is incredibly important. We also know that nutrition is important for maintaining bone health and avoidance of smoking and alcohol uh, are also quite important. But as you know, changing patients' habits is exceedingly difficult. And some patients are on a fixed budget and can't afford fresh greens or can't mobilize to the grocery store. And so nutrition is an issue. Some patients are being taken care of by family who smoke regularly and secondhand smoke can be an issue. Some patients have had uh, you know, addiction issues for their entire lives and that's a tough, those are tough habits to break. So while these seem very simple uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, these are exceedingly complex. So Adam, yeah. you've, got, you've, got 12, you've got 12 questions now. All right, now we're going. All right, so I'm just gonna, uh, you want me to give them to you two at a time, or how would you like me to do this? Yeah, let's shoot. Let's go for right. the, the what? Top, top few questions, uh, right. and I'll do my best to answer them and keep on track. All right. The first two are, what is postural hypotension, and what tools are available to measure risk in a nursing home? That's from Jean. That's a great question. So both great questions. I'm sorry for not um, delving deeper. Postural hypertension, hypotension is um, when you change positions. Uh, and your blood pressure doesn't change accordingly. So we've all had the experience where we're lying down for a long period of time or we're watching TV and we stand up very quickly. We get lightheaded, that's a change in posture. And we're lightheaded because the body has not maintained blood pressure appropriately uh, and has not gotten enough blood to the brain. So that's, uh, that, that's what postural hypotension is. And it's a big issue in our elderly population and a big cause of falls. We will addressing the second question, which was, how do we find risk factors for uh, not only community ambulators, but patients who are in a nursing facility? And the answer to that question is we will talk about it later. Uh, that's the short answer, but the longer answer is it's the same risk factors as we talked about before. So the big, the big players are uh, weakness, uh, dementia, and change in vision and change in balance. Those are the bigger, more common risk factors for falls, both in our community ambulatory population and folks who are in a nursing home. Hopefully those have answered those two questions. Uh, if there are follow-up questions, please feel free to ask, but uh, Karen, let's move on. And okay, you can, um, give so, me the so the next two are from Nancy and Jenny. So if the primary care physician doesn't have time, is the solution a specialist doc? Would that be someone like you? And the second question, any recent data regarding increase in falls since COVID started due to isolation or post-COVID recovery weakness? Wow, uh, fantastic questions. Absolutely fantastic questions. Uh, the first question is a little bit more difficult to answer. 
I am a subspecialist. I'm passionate about fall prevention and prevention of fragility fractures. So yeah, you're kind of asking a barber if you need a haircut. Uh, and so I think um, uh, the subspecialty care uh, is important uh, and is and is a viable option for patients who are having falls or who are concerned about fragility fractures. Um, and I, I don't mean to uh, poo-poo on um, uh, to criticize our primary care uh, colleagues. They are, it is a, an exceedingly, exceedingly difficult job. And I think the more pressing issues like diabetes and lung disease and heart disease deserve the time that they, they get. Um, but oftentimes it's difficult to fit all that in. We have the luxury of you know, an hour during our first appointment with patients to sit down and really go through things soup to nuts. Uh, our primary care colleagues don't have that luxury. So I, I, I think subspecialty care is a very reasonable option, just like your primary care doctor may refer you to a cardiologist or to an endocrine specialist. Uh, so too, can you seek a referral uh, for fall prevention or fracture prevention? And we're, of course, I brag on our clinic and our program, uh, but there are several other options uh, in, in Asheville that, that do a good job. Uh, and the second question was, is there any day, is an excellent question because COVID's changed absolutely everything. Uh, in our lives. Uh, is there any data on how COVID has affected fall um, incidents in the United States? And I, I have not seen any uh, of that data. I will tell you that in my practice, we have seen no change in the number of geriatric fall patients that we're seeing, uh, mostly because these happen around the house or these happen around a facility. Um, we have seen a decrease in our trauma population, our uh, you know, driving down Route 40, bad car accident, or out hiking, uh, bad fall kind of injuries because people are just out less. Uh, but as far as the household slip and fall with fragility fracture, I have we have not seen a decrease there, and I have not seen any data to suggest that there has been a decrease nationwide. That's a really great question. Thank you for asking. Ready for the next two questions? Fire away. How to get your primary doc to address fall or osteoporosis risk from Bill? And well, where may one get his, her risk, fall, fall risk assessed is the cost of the use of this usually covered by Medicare Part B supplements. Great question. So how to, how to get your primary care doctor. Um, you mentioned that you heard a talk with Ollie. You think it's a big problem for you and you want to avoid injury in the future. I, I think that should prompt your primary care doctor to act. And again, it, some, I don't have expertise in treating hypertension, for instance, and some primary care doctors don't feel comfortable treating bone health or fall prevention. And that's where a referral to a specialist, either our shop or any of the other places in Asheville may be, um, may be relevant. Uh, hopefully that answered that uh, question. The next one was whether or not fall prevention physical therapy is covered. Uh, and it almost universally is in our um, patient population. I think insurance companies have finally come around to the fact that preventing falls uh, is more um, uh, financially viable, so to speak, than uh, uh, treating fractures, which is much more expensive. And so they typically cover fall prevention. They may not cover it for three years, uh, but they usually cover it for a period of time when you can master the exercises and be evaluated for home care and uh, durable medical equipment and things like that. Maybe okay. two more, Karen, and then All we'll right. move on. Cool. Um, yes, this is from Kay and Nancy. Should a healthy 73-year-old woman, no falls, take osteoporosis meds, bone density shows borderline osteoporosis, uh, two, about 2.5. And the second question, individual with peripheral neuropathy, is your clinic a place for learning how best to manage to reduce probability of fall? Yes. Oh, great questions. So I'll tackle the first one uh, second. So in terms of neuropathy, that is a huge risk factor for falls. Um, if falling is an issue for you, uh, I think either going directly to physical therapy, fall prevention physical therapy uh, is reasonable. I also think a visit to our clinic or a similar clinic is a viable option for you uh, because falls are so intimately related with uh, fracturing and we can kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone. We don't have you know, a gym in our clinic, you will be referred to a fall prevention physical therapist. Um, but we can certainly, uh, we can certainly uh, expedite that for you. And the second, the first question was about a specific patient with documented osteoporosis. 
um, and whether or not that patient should be on therapy. And we will address that in the next uh, segment. If you don't mind, I'll just delay that. Um, sure. So one of the questions, if you don't mind, Karen, I'll kind of move on. And if there sure. are any questions, um, we will, I will leave time. Sure. One of the questions uh, was related to how your primary care doctor assesses for falls. And there are several ways to do this. Uh, number one is a self-reported uh, rating scale. We'll talk about that. Number two is a uh, single task performance measure. So asking patients to do things. Uh, and number three is asking patients to do a lot of things and evaluating them for falls. So um, we can start, excuse me, by these self-reported uh, clinician rated scales, which basically ask, have you fallen recently and how often? And so you can imagine that that's a reasonable screening tool, uh, but it's not particularly helpful for prediction, right? Because if you've fallen, chances are you're at risk for falling again, and that's common sense. So what we want to do is to prevent a fall from ever happening. And we can screen patients by doing stepping tests like step forward and step back and cross your arms and things like that. There is a four square step test that your physical therapist may administer where you walk forward and then sideways and then backward and sideways again. And that just tests our ability to coordinate movements. And that's been related to falls. My personal favorite is the time to up and go test where patients are asked to um, get up from a seated position, walk three to five meters, turn around and then sit back down. And then the time it takes folks to do that has actually been closely related to fall risk. So these are single exercise measures that we use to um, evaluate for fall risk. Now, you may say, well, if one puppy is good, I have a golden retriever puppy, so I put this slide in. Um, if one golden retriever puppy is good, then a ton must be great. And that may not be true. Um, some people aren't ready to have 10 puppies. But um, so some people uh, think that multiple task performance measures give us a better, more accurate vision of fall risk than having patients stand up, walk three meters and walk back. And that may be true. The upside are these measure, these performance measures are really comprehensive. The downside is they take a lot of time, and a lot of equipment, and there's a fair amount of personnel. This is just one example, again, of a multiple um, uh, requirement fall uh, assessment, fall risk assessment. Here on the right, we see the number of things that patients are asked to do, and we directly observe all these tests. And from this, we can compile a fall risk assessment. If it looks like a lot, it's because it's an awful lot. And most providers don't have the time to do this, and most have most patients don't really feel comfortable uh, undergoing all these tests tests for a period of you know half an hour to an hour. And if we look at the data, just uh, me the medical literature for uh, some of our single performance measures, we see that it's actually pretty accurate. Um, so the higher these numbers, the more accurate a test is at, uh, at predicting falls. And you can see a test like the time to up and go test is actually fairly predictive. So that's what we typically do. Now, we have learned a little bit about the background of osteoporosis. We have begun to think about bone as a microstructure rather than a macrostructure. I have talked to you a little bit about uh, how the typical fracture prevention appointment goes and a little bit about screening. Let's talk about cold hard facts here. How do we make a diagnosis of osteoporosis? And we're actually lucky in the field of bone health that the gold standard for diagnosis is a very easy test. It's a low radiation series of radiographs to determine bone mineral density. That's called a DEXA scan. And you can see that uh, to the below right. It is not an MRI where you're stuck in a tube for an hour. Uh, it is not a stress test where someone has you on a treadmill and you start sweating and feeling funny. It is a simple series of x-rays. And the spit out, the data, uh, comes at you in a form that looks similar to this. And I've highlighted some of the relevant uh, scoring for both the spine and the femur, as you can see. And just as our audience member asked, my T-score is negative 2.5. Uh, so too does this readout suggest uh, negative T-scores, which means that in comparison to the optimal bone mineral density of a young, healthy, active patient. This particular patient is up to 2.7 standard deviations 
away from that bone mineral density. And that's a fancy way of saying uh, they've lost a lot of bone. And we mentioned words like osteopenia when talking about that audience member's question. And osteopenia is between minus one and minus 2.5 on that T-score, meaning you are about a standard deviation to two and a half standard deviations away from the average healthy adult bone mineral density. And for each standard deviation you move from that ideal bone mineral density, your risk of fractures like a hip fracture goes up significantly. So for each standard deviation, it's estimated that your risk of a hip fracture is about 2.5 times that of a normal uh, uh, patient. So this particular patient will just go through his or her numbers. You can see one point, negative 1.7 osteopenia, 2.7 osteoporosis, and so on and so forth. Uh, going down the lumbar spine and then going into the femurs again, uh, minus one to minus 2.5, we call that osteopenia. So this patient is osteopenic in the femoral neck and osteoporotic in the spine. But all these fancy things can't tell us what a fracture tells us. So the National Osteoporosis Foundation and most providers who do this also define osteoporosis as any fragility fracture in any low energy fracture in a patient over the age of 50. So regardless of it's an ankle fracture, a hip fracture, a spine fracture, a wrist fracture, all of these in the low energy circumstance, slip and fall from standing height should not have happened if you had adequate bone mineral density, the bone mineral density of a 20 year old. And so we define osteoporosis, not only by your bone mineral density, from a DEXA scan, but also by the presence or absence of a fragility fracture. There are also some lab evaluations as with everything in medicine, you know you're gonna get a blood draw, you know there's gonna be a bunch of tests. So we'll test the electrolytes in your blood, including calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. We'll test to see if you're anemic. We'll test your vitamin D. And there are some other specialty labs if you have uh, endocrine hormone issues, if you have immune issues, if you have some cancers can contribute to osteoporosis and things like that. So with that data in hand, we can actually make reasonable predictions about who's going to sustain a fall and who's going to sustain uh, a fracture. So this is a complex uh, kind of table, uh, complex graph, but it's very important. So here, on this axis, uh, uh, we have five-year risk of fracture. So 30% risk, 5% risk. And here we have age from 50 to 85. And each of these lines represent a different T-score. So this patient's borderline osteopenic, this patient's osteoporotic, and this patient would be severely osteoporotic. And you see that with, in, with uh, worse T scores and older age, the risk of vertebral fracture, for instance, goes up. So those two things are kind of intuitive, right? The worse your bone, the older you are, the higher your fracture risk. But it's not really all that simple. And nothing in medicine is all that simple, especially osteoporosis care. And there's actually several factors that go into uh, prediction of uh, fragility fractures. One predictive model that's most commonly used is called the FRAX tool, Fracture Risk Assessment Tool. And you can actually go online and put in your numbers and get your fracture risk from the FRAX tool. What it is, is it predicts your risk of a hip fracture and a fragility fra or a fragility fracture at 10 years using a number of different parameters that you can see listed here. This is just a screenshot from the FRAX website, including age, gender, size, prior fracture, medication use, whether or not your parents had fragility fractures, whether or not you smoke or drink, and then something about your bone mineral density. And if you put in this, you will get your uh, risk of a fracture uh, over 10 years. So uh, if your fracture, if your hip fracture risk is over 3% at 10 years, or if your risk at 10 years of any other osteoporotic fracture is greater than 20%, that qualifies you to be on a medication. This is a good answer to your question uh, from the audience about whether or not an osteopenic patient should be on 
uh, a medication? And the answer is it depends on your other factors. So again, if you put your numbers in to this particular predictive tool, which has been shown again and again to be actually very accurate, and the readout spits that your 10 year fracture risk is greater than 3% of a hip fracture that qualifies you to be on a medication. Or if your 10 year risk of a major osteoporotic fracture is greater than 20%, again, that, that gets you um, uh, qualified from Medicare to, to be on a medication. So we've talked now in addition to all the background about diagnosis, but how do we actually uh, treat our patients? So again, we've learned a little bit about the problem. We know the symptoms, we know how to diagnose things. We actually have learned a little bit about prediction of who's gonna sustain a fall and who may have a fragility fracture, but now let's talk about treatment. So again, there are four pillars of fracture prevention care and let's walk through them again. So multimodal treatments of social issues such as increased exercise can actually improve your bone mineral density and present uh, prevent up to 50% of falls and, and uh, excuse me, 50% of fractures in females with osteoporosis. I'll say that again. So some studies have shown that exercise 30 minutes, three times a week can increase your bone mineral density and decrease your fall risk by 50% if you're an osteoporotic female. This guy's got a lot going on. He's a smoker and he's a drinker and he probably should quit those things unless he wants to have a fracture. And I'll put in a shameless plug for mission and telling you that we have very good alcohol and smoking cessation resources. Unsafe ambulation is also a huge part of fall prevention as we talked about. Whether or not this takes the play, uh, uh, is fall prevention physical therapy or appropriate medical equipment uh, or recruiting some help to live your life. Um, all those things can, can be factors and are a part of our treatment protocol. In terms of fall prevention, there's a U.S. task force on this issue that has issued some very, uh, uh, some, uh, some recommendations of, of questionable um, uh, utility, but they recommend uh, exercise intervention for community dwelling folks uh, who are at an increased risk of falls, right? So the more you get up and around, the less likely you are to fall. We know that. They, off, they also recommend uh, selectively multifactorial interventions to prevent falls. We kind of know that that works. And they also said, well, this uh, trend of uh, treating vitamin, giving patients vitamin D to prevent falls may or may not work. We also talked about care facility patients. One of our questions was how do you prevent falls in the care facility patient? The answer is an exercise program, a general medication review as we talked about, and these same kind of multifactorial uh, interventions. Even simple things like bed and chair sensors can reduce the risk of falls very significantly. Specific programs that we would recommend are resistance and weight bearing uh, activities, uh, which can save up to 1% of your bone mineral density per year, and also help to decrease the fear of falling and the number of falls. We also issue patients a home checklist, and this seems silly, but is actually perhaps one of the most powerful things that we do because we know that environment is a factor. These extrinsic issues are a factor in the majority of falls. So a simple checklist like this that tells patients, oh, remove your throw rugs and put lights down and don't have slippery stairs um, and, and maybe transition to a one level house. And all, all these things can be really, really valuable and not so intuitive as you would think. Uh, there are also patients, who, or there are also people whose profession is to perform in-home evaluations where they come to your house, uh, and this has been shown um, to uh, reduce falls significantly. Calcium and vitamin D supplementation. There's been a lot of press about this, um, and I think this is still a little bit up in the air. But our recommendations continue to be for 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day which includes supplements and diet, and also vitamin D up to about 1,000 international units per day. Again, supplementation and diet. And these have been shown again to reduce fracture risk significantly. So this uh, slide is a little busy again, I apologize, but it goes directly to what our audience member was asking. So all these things are great, but let's talk about the big guns. Let's talk about pharmacotherapy medications and people who qualify are postmenopausal females or males over the age of 50 with osteoporosis, documented osteoporosis or a hip fracture. So our specific question, I think our audience member said her bone mineral density is negative 2.5 T-score. She should be on a medication. Also postmenopausal females or males greater than 50 with osteopenia, 
So the on-ramp to osteoporosis and a fras frax risk of hip fractures greater than 3% or any fragility fracture greater than 20% at 10 years uh, should be on a medication. Any patient who has had a fragility fracture should be on a medication. So this equates to about 70% of females over the age of 65 and a, the vast, vast majority, almost universally patients over 75. All right, Karen, I'll be able to tackle a few questions before we talk specifically about medications. All right, uh, Adam, um, gonna have to give me a minute. My computer is hung up, so I'm going to ask me in about five minutes, okay? okay. Uh, so let's uh, delve into medication. So I talk about medications, bone mineral density, like a bank account. There are two ways to improve your bank account. Number one, you can stop withdrawals. Um, and number two, you can deposit more money. And this is the way we think about bones. So there are anti-resorptive medications that prevent the Pac-Man cells of your body from chewing up bone. And those come in three flavors. One is the selecti selective estrogen receptor modulators. It's a mouthful. Number two is the most common osteoporosis medication in the United States, the bisphosphonate group like Fosamax. And number three is a medication called Prolia, which is new over the last 15 years. And then there are medications that can actually deposit bone back in your bone bank account. And those come in two flavors, Forteo and Timlin. We're gonna, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip around through this uh, estrogen modulators. It's a little bit uh, outside the reach of this talk, but the bisphosphonates are kind of the Ford F-150 of medicine. They are uh, always gonna be there, they work, um, but they're nothing uh, luxurious. They come in several different varieties, some of which you take uh, by mouth once a day, like Fosamax, some that you take once a year, like Reclast as an injection. Uh, and these medications, again, prevent the Pac-Man cells of your body from chewing up bone. Uh, there are some downsides, which again, we can talk about a little bit more in detail. I think the most publicized are issues with the jaw, atypical femur fractures, which is a fragility fracture of the femur, and some of the side effects that you see listed, including upset stomach um, and GI issues. But um, despite their age and their commonality, they remain very effective. They can help restore bone mineral density to about one or 4% over a period of years and prevent from 30 to 70% of spine fractures and fractures of the limbs uh, over time. So again, incredibly effective. Prevention between 30 and 70% is a huge number. A medication like Prolia is given once every six months. This is a medication that's an antibody uh, that quiets down those Pac-Man cells. Uh, it's indicated when we use it is for higher risk patients, uh, patients who have uh, problems with their kidneys or who have failed treatment with osteoporosis medications like the bisphosphonates. It can cause your calcium to drop a little bit and some patients have a reaction to the uh, injection, but it's very well tolerated in, in general. This medication Prolia has been shown to be stronger. It's a little bit more like the Cadillac of medications, whereas the bisphosphonates are the F-150. It's a little bit special. It, it provides a little bit more recovery of bone mineral density uh, than the bisphosphonates and prevents a huge number of fractures. So 70% reduction in vertebral fractures, 40% reduction in hip fractures, uh, and 25% uh, reduction of other fractures over a three-year period. So huge, huge, huge numbers. Now, um, we'll talk next about Forteo and Timlos. These are the bone building medications. If you think about Pac-Man cells chewing up bone, there are brick layer, brick mason cells that are laying down bone. And these medications uh, stimulate those cells to lay down more bone. They're actually synthetically made, but they're a, of a, pro, a part of a protein in your body that occurs naturally. These medications are the Mercedes-Benz. They are extremely powerful, and we use them when patients have severe osteoporosis, when they've had a fracture or two fractures already, uh, or when they fail frontline therapy. The downsides is that are just like a Mercedes-Benz, they're expensive, although there are workarounds for that. They are a daily injection, and there are some patients who can't take these medications if they have a high risk of bone cancer. We won't go into exactly what that means, but there are some people who can't take them. 
The people who can take them, however, can expect a huge increase in bone mineral density over the treatment course, which is typically limited to 18 to 24 months. And that increase can be as high as 13%, but is typically more about 10%. So again, we are fighting nature. We are restoring bone to approximately 10% of what you've lost. And that equates to a gigantic risk reduction in fractures. So these studies that are shown here, uh, such as this study in the New England Journal from 2003, looked at patients who have already had vertebral fractures and they put them on this, these medications, uh, Forteo, and they found a 70% reduction in the risk of vertebral fractures versus patients who were not on anything. So again, you're taking the highest risk patients and you're reducing up to 70% of spine fractures and up to 55% of non-spine fractures. So huge, huge, huge numbers. Before we answer questions, I'll just review a little bit that the bisphosphonate should only be taken for about three to five years. Again, those are medications like Fostamax and Beneva and Reclast. Prolia, it's thought to you can take indefinitely. Forteo is a medication that we typically limit to about one and a half to two years. And we typically follow patients with a bone mineral density test every year or two after. So before I get into my shameless plug, Karen, I probably have some time to answer questions, but we're already close to the hour. Um, and believe it or not, I have a hip fracture to fix. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm happy to answer uh, a few uh, of the questions as they come. This is Jacqueline Lowe here. I'm gonna step in and read a few questions for you, Dr. Kaufman. Um, so one of the questions we have here is uh, from, let's see. We've got a question on how can somebody uh, get an appointment with your practice? Is it necessary to have a fracture or a bad fall in order to get a referral? Great. Uh, thanks. That's a, I did not. I did not submit this question myself, uh, but it's a great, uh, shameless, uh, great way to shamelessly uh, uh, um, uh, plug plug our clinic. You do not need a referral. Uh, I will give you a number to call. You simply call that number, and we will make you an appointment. Uh, the vast majority of our patients come from our surgical practice, and as such, have already had a fracture. But we deal in just as much primary prevention patients without a fracture as we do in secondary prevention. And I think it's actually nice to get a hold of patients before something bad happens, right? Prevent the heart attack before the heart attack happens. So um, we will give you a number. If you have a pen and paper handy, it is 213-1994, but that'll be on my concluding slide and we'll have plenty of time to write that down. Uh, I can answer uh, more questions. Great, so we have another question uh, asking, could you please discuss a little bit the role of obesity-driven postural changes in their contribution to a rise in fall risk? Oh my gosh, what an incredible question. So the answer is, so the question is, how does, how does body mass affect fracture risk? And it does so in two ways. Number one, uh, patients who are of a large BMI or who have a high body mass uh, are actually at increased risk of falls. Um, because of exactly what this uh, very keen audience member noted, that they have a change in posture. So uh, these patients are sometimes stooped forward and can lose their balance very easily. Um, as you might expect, we recommend being at a healthy body weight. Um, it, uh, studies have looked to see if obesity actually is protective, uh, acts as kind of a shock absorber, and it is not. Uh, it turns out that those patients with higher uh, body size have a higher energy fall from lower um, from lower heights, right? So if you you know weigh a fair amount and you fall, that's a fair amount of force across the bone. So that's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is we see a number of patients who are underweight that also puts you at a high risk for fractures because of things like dehydration and poor nutrition uh, and other nutritional factors that can contribute to bone mineral density. So a fantastic question. Hopefully that's a reasonable answer. Wonderful. So we have sort of a two-part question here from two different folks. Uh, somebody is asking if there are any fall prevention programs online that you're aware of, and also how they could get a copy of the fall prevention home checklist. Awesome, Chris. Fantastic question. So um, it is simple. It is as simple as asking Dr. Google. You can Google fall prevention checklist, and there are several published online that you can just go to and print out. Uh, the next question is fall prevention therapy. We'll get into some specifics about that, 
but I would imagine you, there are several online classes you can take and several YouTube videos that you could pull up just showing you basic calisthenics, calisthenics balance and stretching uh, and strengthening exercises that, it, that would be valuable for fall prevention. Having said that, there are ways to do those exercises appropriately and there are ways to do them inappropriately. And the safe bet is to talk to a physical therapist for a session and see what they would recommend. All right, if you have time, I have another two part question here. Um, the first part is what about, somebody's asking, what about the impact of low testosterone in men for bone loss? And then on the other side, is estrogen supplement supplementation helpful for bone health? That's, oh, these are such fantastic questions. Thank you guys very, very much. I, um, it's always difficult as a speaker to judge the, uh, the, uh, 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 the education and the um, interest of your audience, but the, these really reflect just a really great depth of knowledge and a really good understanding. I almost wish I made the talk a little bit more advanced. Um, the answer to your first question is uh, testosterone can profoundly affect uh, the maintenance of bone mineral density in the male. And that's one of the main major reasons for testosterone supplementation in the elderly. Having said that, getting into the weeds of the testosterone supplementation is probably outside the scope of this talk. Similar to testosterone, estrogen uh, loss uh, can have a profound effect on bone. And we talked a little bit about some of the estrogen modulators uh, and how those medications can alter bone mineral density. Having said that, as you know, those medications have been shown to have a higher, to, to alter your risk profile for blood clots, uh, for heart attacks and strokes, and for certain breast cancers. Uh, and not being a prescriber of those medications, I would really hesitate to comment more, more on that. And I hope it does, I, I, would, I would do so in hopes that it wouldn't be misconstrued by an audience member who says I need to be on an estrogen. Uh, taking those estrogen medications can improve bone mineral density and prevent uh, fractures, uh, just as testosterone supplementation can do the same in men. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on. And uh, if there's time at the end, we will, uh, we will return to some of those questions. Uh, so at Mission, what we have done is been able to kind of see any patient anytime uh, and even anywhere as we've opened up a telehealth and video health uh, profile. Uh, there are definitely several different ways to get to see us, including picking up the phone and calling us and telling us that you want an appointment. You can do so without a formal referral from your primary care doctor, but that always helps. Um, we've expanded, as someone mentioned, from secondary prevention, you've already had a fracture and we're treating you, to primary prevention, I think I might be at risk, what can you do to help me? And you can see just a, uh, just a snapshot of our volume, and again, this reflects just the huge burden of care in Western North Carolina. Uh, as, as so too does our audience, which you know is, is up around 133 today, which is absolutely fantastic, and I really applaud you. But also, you know, think about how many of your friends probably have not thought about fracture prevention or bone health and how many folks are at risk in Western North Carolina. This is the number of patients we're seeing and I would expect uh, this number to continue to increase exponentially over time. But we are not alone. Uh, this picture is from sunny California where Kaiser Permanente was one of the first health systems to embark on a, health, a bone health program. They were able to, in short order, reduce their hip fracture rate amongst their insured patients by about 40% and save about $30 million just in one year in caring for their own insured patients. This is a, a picture of Danville, uh, Pennsylvania. I went to a school that's just down the street from Danville and I, it is not this beautiful. This must be like a glamor shot of the Susquehanna River. This is not what Danville, <laughs> uh, what I remember Danville looking like, but uh, Danville is famous because Geisinger Health System is an incredible health system. Uh, and again, we're one of the first to implement a widespread, wide reaching fracture prevention program, which increased uh, the bone marrow density testing, increased the number of patients who were appropriately placed on medications and decreased hip fractures. Uh, more locally, uh, places like Greenville and Wake Baptist have a really strong fracture prevention program. Uh, and the phrase says, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. And there are several programs uh, here in Western North Carolina to maintain uh, patients' independent living. There are several programs within your reach. I'll mention a couple of them, Home Instead Senior Care, uh, Care Partners Health Services, the PACE program, 
uh, and of course the emergency alert system uh, via Simply Home or Mission Health System continues to save lives every day. Uh, people in the area who are specifically trained to combat some of the high uh, causations of falls. So balance and vestibular training centers are abound in this area. And I would encourage you, if you have balance issues, if you have issues with hearing, that, that can be a very, very uh, significant risk of falls for falls. And this, these are some of the people who you may seek out. Uh, those of you who are huge Seinfeld fans know that this is uh, Jerry putting on uh, funny glasses before he buys $100 mistakenly of gum from Lloyd Braun. Uh, but suffice it to say, he would probably benefit from visiting uh, some of our local vision experts, including uh, Missions Services, Perfect Balance PT, and the Division of Services for the Blind. Uh, there are some exercise programs. There are a couple of questions about you know, the day-to-day -day of how to train your body to avoid falls. And there's several different ways to do that. One of the most effective is this Feldenkrais therapy. And again, I, I will not do it justice by explaining it in this short period of time, but this is something that you can look into if you are interested. Yoga and Pilates have also shown, been shown scientifically to help prevent falls if done, if done correctly. The specific programs uh, that you may have heard of uh, for Tai Chi are actually also very, very powerful. Tai Chi in general is this East Asian kind of light calisthenics, which is a combination of strength and balance with some kind of light aerobic stuff, but you won't be running three miles as a part of your uh, Tai Chi course. Uh, it's been shown to improve balance and strength and walking speed and quality of life, uh, uh, interestingly enough, in elderly patients. And meta-analyses, analyses of other studies suggest up to a 20% decrease in the number of patients who are falling and the frequency of falls being actually statistically significantly uh, decreased. And there are several in the area. I'll put in a plug for WNC Tai Chi for arthritis, which is a very good program. Some programs that are unique to our area in Western North Carolina. Uh, the Fall Prevention Coalition, of which I'm a proud member, is a really, really great program. And again, promotes community awareness, provider education, screening, and assessment to prevent falls. Um, this is a, they have a fair every year, not this year because of COVID, but the, um, uh, if you're in a facility, you can go. If you're a part of the Y, you can go. Uh, it's, it's a really powerful group of people who share the same passion uh, for fracture prevention. The PACE program is one of my favorite programs here. This is an, a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, these are for patients who have uh, significant medical and physical needs, but want to remain at home. Uh, and basically this is, becomes a one-stop shop for primary care, emergency care, hospital care, medications, physical therapy, meals, dentistry, social work, and transportation is shown here. Uh, it's a program that's done through Mission that if uh, you think you may be interested in, I would encourage you to visit their website. A Matter of Balance, which you probably have heard of, I would imagine, is a service through UNC, again, designed more so to combat the mental issues with fear of falling uh, uh, than uh, as much as the physical problems. So these are eight two-hour sessions, including group discussions and physical therapy uh, training sessions. Uh, wherein uh, students and patients are uh, trained to uh, think less about falls and uh, be more physically ready uh, to mobilize without a risk of fall. The CHAMP program is another uh, interesting program here uh, that's designed to improve the health of our community dwelling adults with increased risk of falls. And again, is a free and multidisciplinary service designed to increase strength and balance and mobility and all those things we've been talking about with uh, multidisciplinary care from physical therapists, nurses, and a, a fantastic team of people. Council for the Aging also has several resources uh, to talk about, but are probably a little bit outside the scope of this talk. So uh, my voice is starting to crack, but uh, we are finishing up. Let's talk, uh, revisit our 85-year-old patient who's now had a second hip fracture from a ground level fall. We know a little bit, hopefully you'll leave this talk knowing some of the problems that this patient can encounter, both medical, medical contributors to uh, his, his fractures, physical contributors to falls, social issues that may cause falls. Hopefully we know a little bit about the treatment options available to this patient. 
Hopefully we know that if this patient is lucky enough to live in Western North Carolina, that there are several specialty programs available uh, to aid in the care of this fracture and the prevention of further fractures. I'll thank you very, very much for your attention. It is an absolute honor to speak to you. I cannot tell Karen how much I appreciate uh, her invitation, her kind invitation and the work she's done to make this program uh, successful. It is humbling to see so many people uh, asking amazingly in-depth and appropriate questions and so many people uh, tuning in. And I just, I really can't thank you enough for, for your attention. Hopefully I've done my part uh, to introduce the problem of falls and fragility fractures. Hopefully you're armed with some information about these. Hopefully we've been able to effectively review the data on screening and treatment to outline my particular approach to fall prevention and how, and the mechanics of that referral process. And uh, I've been, again, incredibly impressed by the, by the breadth and depth of your questions. And um, I really look forward to learning a lot from you down the line. This is some of that information about my practice, uh, surgical practice, which hopefully none of you will ever need unless you need your hip replaced. Um, <laughs> hopefully it's not over a fracture. Uh, and then the information for the Mission uh, Fracture Prevention and Bone Health Clinic. Uh, I thank you again so much for your time. And um, I have, uh, you know, a few minutes to, to go through any, uh, any other questions or concerns and uh, Karen and I have worked it out. So if there are other pressing questions, she can compile them and I can respond to them and potentially we can update you on some of those responses or publish some of those responses, but I'm happy to um, address anything now. Dr. Adam Kaufman, this is Karen Sanders back online with you. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm seeing, um, um, just a couple more questions. Are you able to do that or do you yes, need to? Uh, so we have questions from Bill. Will you address shoe choice and fall risk? And what do you think of the value of fall training? I think you've already, um, I think you have already offered that. And value of getting a hip replaced to reduce fall risk. Oh, okay. Great question. So footwear is a big issue. Um, there are several reasons uh, why, why footwear is an, is an important part of it. Uh, and, and patients think of the uh, footwear only, but it's actually a lot to do with the surface you're walking on as well. Um, so it's a lot of home care to make sure that there's no loose rugs and freshly waxed floors and all that stuff. Um, but the footwear is a big, big aspect of it. It's probably a little bit too much to talk about here because it has a lot to do uh, with the, sens the sensory issues that the patient uh, who asked the question about peripheral neuropathy brought up. Um, but suffice it to say, individual footwear is um, very much tied to an individual's neurologic status and their ability to, uh, to walk confidently uh, and to sense things. And um, we will probably, I'll probably leave that answer uh, there in hopes of going on to some of the other uh, answers, uh, which were, does uh, a hip replacement make sense for fall prevention? It does and it doesn't. Um, a hip replacement surgery is done for pain and quality of life. So if you are falling because your hip hurts or your groin hurts, uh, and you feel as though a change in that pain could, uh, could uh, improve your strength and improve your fall risk, I think absolutely it can be helpful. What we see a lot of is patients who have surgery and then their fall risk transiently goes up. So patients who have a big surgery, who are in pain, who are on pain medications, who may be not at home in a familiar environment fall. So I would say in general, uh, decreasing your pain with a hip replacement surgery can significantly decrease fall risk, but it also comes with a short-term increased risk as you recover from surgery and get to know uh, your new hip. Karen, there was one more question in that series that I forgot. Um, let's see. Well, let's see. Could there was you... a footwear, the hip replacement, and I think there was another. Um, I have, what do you think of the value of fall training um, for older adults, how to fall more safely? Okay. Um, that's a great question. There is mixed data uh, on that. There have been studies to, su to suggest that it's helpful and studies to suggest that it's not so helpful. Um, I think it's a reasonable thing to talk to your fall prevention therapist about. You know, obviously, um, we would hope that fall prevention therapy prevents the falls, but certainly there may be some benefit 
to know, quote unquote, knowing how to fall correctly. Um, yeah, obviously our goal is to, to, to prevent all falls. Um, and I, I, again, I think the medical community is a little bit mixed about whether or not learning how to fall correctly is important. I don't think it can hurt. And I think it's worth reviewing with your fall prevention therapist. And let's see, we've just got, will this program be available at Mayhek? Um, I don't know about that. So great question. Uh, Mayhek is a wonderful, wonderful organization. I cannot tell you uh, how much I admire the work they do for patients. They're great providers. They're, it's a great institution and they have an osteoporosis clinic as well. Uh, I am not as familiar uh, with the inner workings of how that happens. I am sure that if you're a Mayhek patient, they will get you in and they will take wonderful care of you. Uh, but there is a Mayhek specific osteoporosis uh, management clinic, and I can only imagine they have strong connections with fall prevention providers in the area. And let's see, looks like the DAS, what's the difference between a T-score and a Z-score? Okay, so great question. I, again, I kind of glossed over this a little bit because you'll hear uh, mostly about the T-score. This is what we base your fracture risk on because it stays the same. It is, again, the T-score is your bone mineral density compared to a 25 year old of your gender, right? Uh, the peak bone mass, average peak bone mass of, of a male or female respectively, uh, depending on who you are. Um, so th that, that um, peak bone mass never changes. The only thing that changes is your uh, bone mass in relationship to that. And that's again, what we base all of our diagnosis and decision-making on. Uh, a Z-score is you compared to a cohort of patients your same age, a group of patients your same age. So the T-score will naturally be higher than the Z-score. Excuse me, the, the Z-score will naturally be higher than the T-score, but it's actually less useful to us as providers. It always gets spit out by the computer, but we very rarely use it in assessing your fracture risk. So Z-score compares you to people your same age. T-score compares you to the gold standard that never changes. And that's why we use the T-score more commonly. So um, there is this presentation is going to be available in about two to three weeks on the OLLI website. Um, Jacqueline is going to type that in the chat box. The website is olliashville.unc.edu. When you open up that OLLI website, you are going to search for presentations and this, web, this presentation by Dr. Kaufman will appear and you can download that. Okay, let's see, do, let's see, do trans people need to be conscious of bone health as they go through transition and the drugs that are part of the transition? Yes, absolutely yes. Um, as one of the other audience members noted, um, the, uh, what's commonly known in the medical community as the sex hormones, the, the hormones that determine um, the, the sex of a baby, and so we call them sex hormones moving forward, like testosterone and like estrogen, profoundly affect uh, bone mineral density. And there, uh, we have not, as a medical community, gotten enough data together to know how that affects the transitioning community or the transition community. But I will tell you that it is something that we're all uh, very interested in uh, seeing moving forward. Uh, if you are taking estrogen supplements, suffice it to say that will profoundly affect your bone health. And the same thing is true for the testosterone supplements. And it may be worth getting a bone mineral density test kind of early, sooner rather than later, um, just to see uh, where you are and to monitor that much more closely than you would uh, uh, otherwise, because we, we just don't know what that's gonna look like long-term. That's, um, that's a really, really great question. Thank you for asking. That was from Annie. Thank you, Annie. And from Suzanne and DB, there's uh, two questions. Any downside to Prolia? And please address pets as a fall hazard. Okay, uh, so uh, my mom's a veterinarian, so pets are great. <laughs> um, no one give up their pet, but they, they, no, it can it can result in falls. Uh, we see if uh, there's not a month that goes by that I don't get a patient who has a fracture because they tripped over their pet. Um, 
Having said that, I'm not going to get rid of my dog. That's no, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, I, I think it is a risk. I don't know how to mitigate that risk except to um, find another home for your animal, uh, which is not acceptable for most folks. But um, I don't know if there's a way you can train your dog to stay out of the way or something, but it is something uh, to be very concerned about, especially at night. Uh, we see a lot of patients get up at night to go to the bathroom. They don't have their walker. Um, they don't put their appropriate footwear on and the dog is sitting in the, on the bathroom floor, which is poorly lit and they take a spill. That does happen. Um, and I'm so sorry. I forgot the first part of that question, Karen. Let's see any downside to Prolia. Oh, yes. Great. Prolia. Um, Prolia is a great medication. It is extremely clean, meaning it has very few side effects. Some people have some dizziness or body aches with the injection, which is once every six months. It is exceedingly powerful at preventing fractures, up to 70% reduction in vertebral fractures, up to 40% reduction in non-vertebral fractures. It is extremely well tolerated. We take very few patients off of Prolia because of side effects. There are some side effects, uh, the most common of which is hypocalcemia, which means a drop in your calcium. So if you have a low calcium to begin with, it may not be the right medication for you. Having said that, it's very clean. It's reasonably affordable. It's very user friendly as a um, as a once every once every six month injection, and you can take it indefinitely. Unlike the bisphosphonates like Fosamax, which we really don't prescribe more than a few years anymore. Uh, and the same thing is true with the bone building medications. They have a shelf life of about two years. Is about all we can use them for. Um, the Prolia can be used indefinitely. It's an extremely good medication. I I really love Prolia. I think it's, it's, I think it's a great medication, but as with everything, you know, there are downsides and there are risks and, uh, you know, you have to mitigate those and talk to your provider about them. But I think in general, it's, it's an outstanding medication. And there is a question. There are five different locations and scores for the DEXA. Is my score the average of them? And is there one more important? Great question. Uh, debated hotly amongst providers. Uh, whether or not uh, we should worry more about the low lumbar reading or the high lumbar reading or the femur, or does a low femur put you at risk for a femur fracture more than a low spine at risk for spine and so on and so forth. The bottom line is there's several different x-rays that are taken of several different parts of the body, uh, and those are all recorded. So typically patients have three readings or so in the spine and then each hip is done. There are some exceptions to that when patients who have ha had prior fractures or replacements or arthritis or something like that, that can throw off the score. But in general, you'll get several spine scores as well as uh, each, each femur score. Uh, and that's why your readout says what it says. I personally don't think there's a huge difference between someone who's osteoporotic in one place and somebody who's osteoporotic in the other place. I treat them all the same. Uh, and we typically base treatment on the worst score. So in, uh, if your femur is a minus 1.5 and you don't qualify for medication there, but your spine is minus 3.5 on your T-score, we're gonna probably consider your spine uh, the most at risk and, and get you on a treatment. So we, we, we are pessimists. We use the worst, the worst number. Um, next question, if hit by car when young with multiple broken bones, does that affect the T-score? Uh, that's an excellent question. So prior fractures, healed fractures do affect your score, especially if you've had spinal compression fractures, which a lot of our osteoporotic patients have had. Uh, the other things that can affect the score are arthritis. So if you have hip arthritis, your score will artificially be higher. Uh, if you have a healed fracture and there's extra bone there, your score will artificially be higher. Um, and if you had a hip replacement or any kind of metal, you should make sure that no one is using a score from that area. Uh, but yes, it will. It will probably not profoundly affect it. And in truth, we can just substitute, you know, we get a broad picture just from your spine and the other sort, the other areas in the body. You can also take a DEXA scan from the wrists uh, if you need uh, uh, accessory areas to, to judge someone's overall bone mineral density. All right, Adam, I believe that is, that's all. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, if anything else comes up, if there are any other questions, uh, I think Karen has been nice enough to put her email address there, karen at rnpatientadvocacy.com. Um, and uh, she can forward specific questions on to me. 
Uh, I will look forward to seeing you all as patients in the fracture prevention care uh, program rather than the uh, fracture treatment program. Uh, I don't, <laughs> don't wanna see anybody for surgery or for a fracture. Uh, and again, I really can't thank you enough for your attendance, for your attention, for your extremely thoughtful questions uh, and for your, for your interest in this uh, very relevant topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Adam Kaufman. That was a fabulous presentation. And lastly, just one last suggestion to go to his presentation, which show up on the OLLI website in about two to three weeks, you are going to uh, go to the OLLI website, olliashville.unca.edu. And once you pull up the website, you're going to search presentations and his should be the first on the top of the list for 2021. Thank you all for your attention and your questions. We hope to see you at our next Fab Friday uh, presentation sometime in February. Many blessings. See you. Thank you.